Church will begin again on July the 5th. Until that time, um, the Bible woman is going to have a Facebook uh, video for our kids to watch. And she had a great one yesterday, and so I want you to turn your attention to the screen. And, and um, she has a great lesson for us. I wouldn't want to take a, I wouldn't want to fight her in a sword fight. Though, so. <laughs> All right, guys. Jesus is right. 
verse goes on to say that Jesus does not hurt that person more, but treats them with kindness, gentleness, and compassion. But you know what, friends? We may not always know when someone's hurt. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So, if you have find yourself being mean to anyone in any way, stop and remind yourself how the Bible describes Jesus. And you say to yourself, a bruised tree you will not break. Say it with me. A bruised tree you will not break. Mother! A bruised reed he will not break. Wonderful. I think I heard Alexis and Kylie say that together. And I believe I even heard Lily number one and Lily number two. Maybe even Lizzie and Brayden. That was really good. Well, you know, friends, we may not be able to change everyone in this world, but we can certainly change what we do. Remember, a bruised reed you will not break, and you're going to treat everyone with gentleness and kindness and compassion. You may know who is hurt, who is that bruised reed, and you may not. And even you might be a bruised reed yourself. Just remember, Jesus loves you, and he is always the same. A bruised reed, he will not break. Okay, friends, that's all for today, but I will be back next week. And remember, Children's Church, July 5th. See you next week. <laughs>
is perfect, but Lord, you are. But we want to thank you for our fathers. We uh, ask you to bless them, encourage them, help them. Um, we need godly fathers. Uh, we need men who are faithful uh, to their families, faithful to their wives, faithful uh, to your church. Uh, and I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, use these men for your glory, for your kingdom. Uh, bless them, encourage them in every way as they lead, as they uh, are the spiritual leaders of their homes, Lord. Help them to really take that role seriously uh, and lead their families to follow you. We thank you again for them. Thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through faith in Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated, guys. Thank you. 
Yes, amen. Thank you, Margie. I think the ocean behind you is very appropriate. It's been a ship sailed by with an anchor. It would have been even more so. <laughs> but it's a great song. Uh, when we moved here in 1983, our daughter Jessica was just a couple of weeks old. And I'll never forget her birth at the hospital in Athens, Tennessee. Uh, you know, some of you remember Lamont's classes were very popular back in those days. But one and I, never, we had never taken one of them. And I'm not sure, if, I think we may have had some kind of an orientation class. I'm not, we did. Uh, but anyway, they let me stay in with Wanda during labor. And at one point, they asked me to push Wanda up into a sitting position while she was having contractions. Well, they hadn't told me how to do that. Uh, so I got over there and did the best I can to push her up. Well, wouldn't you know it, I wrenched my back. <laughs> it was agonizing pain. But I manned up, I didn't, I gritted my teeth, I didn't act like anything was happening, I just persevered through that anguish. <laughs> And finally, Wanda had Jessica. Uh, it was a girl, yay! It was after having two ratty little boys, we were so happy to have a, a daughter, and I was happy I could go home and lay down and rest my back. I thought, man, if this is what it's like to have, I don't think we'll have any more. <laughs> and we didn't. <laughs> man, it's really tough. But, I'm sorry. I don't think she was very sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> it's really tough being a father, amen. <laughs> and we can joke about being a father, but you know, being a father is no joke. It's a great privilege and it's an awesome responsibility. And the message I have today uh, to bring is it's not just for fathers. It's uh, for all men. Well, actually, it's for all believers. Uh, and our scripture is the song of two paths or the song of a blessed man. And it's Psalm 1. So if you have your Bible with you, and I hope you bring your Bible, we're not keeping Bibles in the pews because of possible transmission of the virus. But uh, uh, bring your Bible or look at it on your phone or your device. Uh, let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word for those who uh, feel like standing today or can. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. That's the first path. Now here's the second path. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will, not, will perish. Father, we thank you for your word, the truths in it. May we open your word faithfully often and allow you to speak to us and shape our lives. As men, may we allow your word through the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus, your son. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Today's the, the psalm, the very first psalm, has six verses, but we're just going to fo focus on the first three, uh, verses one through three. And it's about being a blessed man. It's the psalm of a blessed man. And a godly man is a blessed man. And guys, I don't think that it's coincidental that the Holy Spirit led King David to place this psalm as the very first one uh, in, well, what's called the Psalter, uh, the Book of Psalms. Uh, because if we get this one right, 
almost everything else is going to fall into place. If we live as godly men, we're going to be blessed men, and the rest of it uh, is going to fall into place for us. So what does a blessed man do? I want us to see three things, or actually two things that he does, and then the result of that. The first thing is a blessed man guards his walk. As we see in verse 1, Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. And the word for blessed there is an interesting word, I think. It, and it best translated as truly happy or very fortunate. If you count yourself to be very fortunate, then you tell them, I'm blessed. I'm a blessed man. And there are three things that are mentioned here uh, that, guys, we must do or avoid uh, to be blessed. And the first one is, I will guard my mind. I will guard my mind. Uh, don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, there's a lot of counsel out there in this world. There's a lot of advice out there available. There's probably uh, 10,000 messages out there you can listen to. And the psalmist says, don't listen to any of those. Listen to God. Every other one, even though it may sound good on the surface, is not the counsel you should be following. There's only one good news. There's only one gospel. There's only one Bible. The philosophy of the world, <laughs> excuse me, without God, is often includes something like this. Life's really about me, so I'm going to live it for me. I'm going to do what I think is best for me. And so I need to enjoy it now and pay for it later. Uh, and really, there's no rules or limits. Um, I just go out and do it. Uh, to live independently of God is the first temptation that man faced. When you look at the story of Adam and Eve, there was, well, we don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. And so we're going to be disobedient, and we're going to live life the way we want to do it. But a godly man recognizes that the ungodly should never be consulted. When you have an issue in life, when you have a, a struggle, when you have a problem, where do you turn? Who do you listen to? Dr. Phil? I don't know, I never listen to Dr. Phil or, or any of those folks on TV. I'm not saying they're bad people, but I'm just saying their counsel is not godly counsel. Uh, you go to the Word of God. Uh, for the, 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 wor the world says you don't need God. You don't need God. You, you, you can live life on your own. I can do it by myself. But as I've said often, in the months I've been here, God never made you to live life on your own. He created you specifically to live life in relationship with Him. There is a void in your life. And only God can fill that void because God is the one who created that in you. He wants you to link your life up with Him he wants you to listen to Him. He wants you to belong to Him. And He wants you to follow Him. So guard your mind. What is it that you're listening to? What are you feeding into your thoughts in your mind? I will guard my mind. Secondly, I will, I will guard my actions. First one says, don't stand in the way, or we could say the roadway, of sinners. And the word for sinners here is an interesting word. It's not the most common word in the Bible for sinners, but it means to make a loud noise or a tumult. Uh, it means to provoke a riot, uh, to create a disturbance, to be a troublemaker. And so the psalmist says, Don't, do not stand in the road with those who are provoking Riots who are causing trouble. A godly man is not a troublemaker. You're not causing a disturbance at work. You're obedient to the laws of life and the land and to our land that we live in. And to stand with means to support. Uh, to support it. Support doesn't mean you're actually necessarily involved in it. 
you're not necessarily joining in with what they're doing, but you're supporting their behavior. You're not speaking out against it. You're not saying that's wrong. You're just kind of standing there uh, with them and they're doing this stuff and you're just a part of it. Just not really, really involved in it. A real man doesn't stand with those who are causing trouble. He doesn't hold to that kind of morality. Jesus tells us how we must relate to the world. In John 17, Jesus says, They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And that's kind of a hard a couple of verses there for us to wrap our heads around. What does Jesus mean we're not in the world? I mean, we're born in this world. How can we not be uh, of this world? We're not of this world because we've been born again. And we have a new citizenship. And that citizenship is in heaven. Uh, that's where we belong. Uh, this world is not our home. Uh, we're just a passing through, as the song says. And uh, we, we're not citizens here. And the Father sent Jesus into the world to demonstrate, to show us true righteousness. He also sent Jesus to die for our sins and not have salvation. But He sends us into that world now. As His children, as, he, as Jesus was sent, so the Father sends us. And he sends us to show the world through our lives, through our obedience, that grace, God's grace, can change any life. We're to be trophies of God's grace. Not that we go out there proud and, oh man, you know, I'm, I'm a, this great Christian and I do this, I do that. But we go out there and with great gratitude that God has forgiven us and saved us and we share the good news to the world by our words and by our actions. So we guard our actions. We're, it's kind of like a boat. A boat is designed to be in the water, right? But what happens when the water gets in the boat? Mm, it starts to sink. Uh, that's how we're to be in the world. Uh, the world is not to get in us because once the world gets in us, it sinks our witness. You know, we've heard this term before, a worldly Christian. That's an oxymoron. Should never go together. A worldly Christian. We're to be godly Christian, godly men, godly women. So I will guard my mind, I'll guard my actions. And the third thing is I will guard my friendships. Does not sit in the seat of mockers. There's a digression that takes place here. Not a progression, but a digression. First he walks, and then he stops and he stands. And if he continues to do that, what happens? He's sitting with them. He's sitting with the people who mock God. And the psalm is not just talking about unbelievers here. David's not just talking about unbelievers. He's talking about those who are openly rebellious toward God and toward the truths of God's Word. And folks, if that's not true of our culture today, I don't know when it's been true. So many are just openly mocking the truths of the Word of God. A blessed man, God's man, doesn't sit with those who mock the things of God. Why? Because to sit in this verse means to join with. It's not just that you go sit down for a while and you're visiting and you're going to get up and go. It means that you are identifying with them. You have become one with them in what they're doing. The Holy Christian Standard Version translates that verse this way. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of of mockers. Alexander Pope described the process I think that we've seen here in America in the last few decades. When we see evil, first we are repulsed, then we endure it, then we pity it, and then we embrace it. Isn't it true that in America today that we're embracing things that just a few decades we would never have imagined. 
that we could be embracing as a nation. There's nothing wrong with being friendly or showing compassion to the law. Actually, we need to. We're supposed to be doing that. We're not supposed to bruise a reed, are we? Uh, we're supposed to be out there showing love and concern and, and compassion uh, to the world. Uh, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. He ate in their homes. He, he spent time with them because he knew that they needed God in their lives and he was there to share the truth with them, to show them the way of life, but he never joined in their sin. He never sat down with a group of mockers. You know, he didn't stand in the way of sinners uh, approving or uh, of what they were doing by any means. He would always say, go and what? Sin no more. Go and sin no more. And like Jesus, we should develop a relationship with unbelievers. We need to be genuine friends to those who don't know the Lord. What I mean by that is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become your friend. You don't know Christ, so I'm going to become your friend so I can lead you to the Lord. And I can mark you on my belt. You know, I've, I've led somebody else to Christ, and I've got all these folks here. That's not what I mean by being a friend. I mean, be somebody's friend whether they ever accept Christ or not. Just be their friend. And use the opportunity God gives you uh, to share your faith with them. But we guard our friendships in that we don't join in with those who are mocking God. We don't become one with them. So a godly man doesn't join in with the world. He doesn't think or behave like the world. He guards the walk of his life. How do you guard that walk? This is key, guys. It really is. How are you going to guard your walk when there's 9,999 other voices out there saying do this, but there's only one right way? How do you guard that walk? The second thing we see is that a blessed man puts God first. In verse 2, but the delight, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night, both day and night. How, how can we reject this world's philosophy? It's so prevalent. It's everywhere we turn. It's in the world of entertainment. It's uh, in uh, written form. It's turn on your radio. You're hearing it. How do you reject that world's philosophy? You learn to delight in the law of the Lord. Now, the law of the Lord, we can say, equals the Scripture. Now, the law of the Lord equals the Word of God. And the Word of God gives us a very different view of life than what we get from the world. This should always be the measure of what we're going to do in life. We hear all these messages where we go, what does God's Word say? What does God's Word say? And it may be that I really like what they're saying more than I like what this says, <laughs> but I'm going to submit to God's Word because I want to be a, a godly man. I want to live a blessed life. So we get the right view, the only right view of how to live life comes from this Word, the Word of God. You know, our minds and our hearts are made to be filled with God's truth. God made us with minds and hearts. and He wants to fill us with His truth. But if it's not filled with His truth, you know, we, sometimes we talk about, you know, so-and-so is just empty-headed. That's not true. There's nobody that's empty-headed. If your mind and heart is not filled with the truth of God's Word, it's going to be filled with the world, the lies of the world. It's going to be filled with something. And the Bible tells us the truth about life. The Bible shows us where to walk, where to stand, where to sit. And the reason that we don't think or behave like the world is because we have a different set of instructions. We have one voice that we listen to, and it is the Word of God through the Word of God. God speaking to us. His set of instructions. You can know the very God of creation. I, to me, that's just a phenomenal thought. Is that I, well, nobody, me, I can know the God of creation? How can I know Him? Well, through faith in Jesus Christ, I have a personal relationship with God. Through faith in Jesus Christ, but I come to know Him through His Word. Because it's in His Word that I read of who God is. I read about His characteristics. I read about His heart and His plan for me. 
And that's how I come to know who God is. How do I know? By reading His life instruction that's written to us. I mean, there's so much value and guidance and encouragement in the Word of God. Have you been discouraged through the last few months? I ran into someone the other day at uh, Food City there in Seymour, a church member at uh, First Baptist Seymour. And uh, she's a widow, lives by herself. And she said, Brother Bruce, she just said, this is, it really messed with my mind. She said, I, I was really fearful for a while. And, and they, they, being the church, brought me a computer and set it up for me so I could watch services. Uh, and she said, it really made such a difference for me to be able to worship with God's people and hear God's word proclaimed. Uh, and folks, we need to understand uh, that it's God's word to us. It's, it's so full of, of, of value and truth. A whole lifetime is not long enough to appreciate the Bible's truths and make them real in our lives. Carl Sharsmith, you probably not ever heard of him, but he was a renowned guide in Yosemite National Park. He died in 2016. He was 91 years old. He was the oldest ranger uh, that they had ever had. And one day a lady asked him, I've only got one hour to spend in Yosemite. What should I do? What should I go see? And here's what he said to her. If I only had one hour to spend in Yosemite, I would walk over by the river and sit down and cry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, that's what God's Word is like. There is so much to see. So much to hear. So much to learn. You see, you can never come to God's Word and say, man, there's nothing. I've read all of it. I know all this. I've heard everything I need to. No. It's just like going to Yosemite. You never see it all. You'll never read it all. There's just so much. And a blessed man, God's man, delights in reading and applying or meditating on God's Word. The word there for meditate doesn't mean just think about it. It doesn't mean just, I'll just think it over. What it means is to constantly speak it over and over in a quiet voice in your heart. Meditating is a lot like ruminating. Um, cows ruminate. A cow chews its cud, it swallows it, and then it verbs it up. I don't know what else, I don't know how it brings it back up. But somehow it brings it back up. It says there's more there to get out of it. So it chews it some more. And that's really what meditating is about. It's taking God's Word. And, and you think on it. And you think, wow, that's, that's a great truth. That's, I can apply that to my life. And then you think, well, there's more. And I can think about that same verse again. And I get a different truth. And so that is the value of meditating on the Word of God. And guess, men, guess what? When you're thinking on Scripture, you cannot think a sinful thought at the same time. You really can't think two things at once. I know some of you can multitask, but you really cannot think two separate things at once. And so if you're thinking on the truth of God's Word, you cannot be thinking sinful things at the same time. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. But man, the problem with a lot of us is we are rarely in God's word unless we're in church. Unless we're in church. And if the only time that we're in the word of God is on Sunday, then you're not going to know what it is to be a blessed man. You're not going to know the blessings of God. That is the only time. We Taking God's Word into us is something that must happen on a daily basis so that it will be a Word that is living in us and through us. We are told that as newborn babies, we should desire to feed on the milk of God's Word. Now let's say that you have a baby. Does that baby want to eat only on Sundays between 10.30 and 11.30? <laughs> no. 
And it's important to eat just once a day, every day a week. One time a day, every day, no. How many times a day does a baby eat? Enough to wear you out, right? Yeah. It's over and over and over again. And that's how we are to desire the Word of God. The more you go to the Word, and the more you receive from the Word, then the more that the Word is going to flow to you and through you to be a blessing to others. Has the Word of God dried up in you? Then it's because you neglected it. It's not the Word's fault. Because you've neglected it. So reset your priorities. God first. A godly man guards his mind and he puts God's first. And what's the result of this kind of life? Well, we see that in verse 3. A blessed man will prosper. He's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Godly men are like healthy trees. God promises that if you will shun godly counsel, if you'll hunger for His Word, then you're going to be like a healthy tree that's planted by streams of water. You ever notice sometimes you'll be driving down a country road and you're passing these fields and you look out across the field and you see a row of trees going down this way. What is a logical assumption when you see that row of trees? There's a stream right over there. And those trees are growing there because they are constantly being nourished by that stream. If we're constantly being nourished by the Word of God, that we can say with confidence just like that tree planted by the stream of water, I'm going to grow. Like a, a, a tree whose roots are down there and it's pulling that moisture in, that nourishment in from the stream. You're going to be steadfast. There may be a, a dry field next to it, but you're going to be like that tree. You're going to be green and lush Steadfast, faithful in life. You're not going to be on some spiritual roller coaster back and forth. And if you do what it says in verses 1 and 2, your life will be rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, and you're going to grow to be like Him. You're going to grow, not just grow big, but you're going to grow to be like Jesus. Secondly, we can say with confidence, I'm going to bear fruit. God's plan is we bear fruit. John 15, 8. This is to... To my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, when people look at your life, man, do they see good fruit? Do they see Jesus' qualities being exhibited through your life? What is the fruit of a Christian life? Galatians 5, 22, 23 tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is that what people see when they see your life? You know, the more you apply God's Word to your life, the more that fruit is able to come from the inside out and be seen as Jesus seen it. You see, we don't, we don't produce fruit. Jesus produces His fruit in us. We are the branches. He's the vine that Jesus displays His fruit upon. Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. nothing. We can do nothing that is honoring and pleasing to God apart from that relationship with Christ. So you will have love and joy and peace. And man, what a promise is that? Who doesn't want to experience that in your life? That's true blessing. And that's also true prosperity. The third thing we can say with confidence, I will be a blessing. Whose leaf does not wither. I'm not talking about a maple tree that goes out in blazing glory. It talks about it's like an evergreen. It's constantly alive. You know, trees are blessings, aren't they? Uh, in my yard, I, I admit, I, I told Wanda, and it was my experience here at Armona. It was okay. But you know the parsonage? Huge oak trees. I never got so tired of breaking leaves <laughs> in my life. And when we lived there in that pastorium, every year it was leaves after leaves after leaves. And so, when we built a house, I said, I don't want a lot of big trees. <laughs> and so, all we have is just a couple of little trees in front. But we did have one big tree out on the end of the, the property. It was a, an old wild cherry tree. And our grandkids loved it because it was a great climbing tree. But it rotted in the heart of it. I could tell it was rotted. And I had to cut it down. And they were so upset with me. And they couldn't understand, well... I would have to cut that tree down, then it fell on you. 
and hurt you. But, but trees are blessed. You like to be around trees. There's just something about a tree, you know. It, it's cool and comfort and shade. And birds and animals uh, find homes in them. And, and for the most part, trees are, are a great blessing. Godly men are men who guard their walk. They delight in the Word of God. And they're like trees. They're a blessing to others. Whatever you do, prosper. That doesn't mean that you're going to be a millionaire. It's not what he means by prosper. But what he means is that your influence, the influence of your life is going to be a blessing to so many. That's what a truly blessed man is. You can be a blessing to others. Does it say it's going to be easy? Matter of fact, to live this kind of life will be the most difficult and challenging life you can live. Why? Because you're going against the flow of this world. If you live a godly life. And so it's going to be challenging. But it's going to be the most rewarding life you can live because you're doing it God's way. The way God meant for you to do. Men, America needs you to be a godly man. More than ever before. And the church needs it more than ever before. Your family needs it more than ever before. They need you leading the way. Be a man who guards his way. Delights in the word. And you will be a blessed man. So I said, Psalm 1 is, is a song about two different paths. The path of the godly or the ungodly. The righteous or the unrighteous. Verses 1 through 3 are that way of blessing. Verses 4 through 6 are the way of ruin. And what David is saying is, don't walk that way. Don't go that way. Instead, commit yourself to guarding your heart and to falling in love with the Word of God. And you will be a blessing. Today our hymn of invitation is going to be... Uh, well, let me read to you the first verse of it. Is your life a channel of blessing? Is the love of God flowing through you? Are you telling the loss of the Savior? Are you ready His service to do? And then in the psalm we make a commitment. Make me a channel of blessing today. Make me a channel of blessing, I pray. My life possessing, my service blessing. Make me a channel of blessing today. Man, that, that needs to be the commitment of our lives. Women, that needs to be the commitment of your life. Boys and girls here today, it needs to be the commitment of your lives. Lord, make me a channel of blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come now to this time of invitation, time of commitment of our lives, I pray that each of us would recognize that there's really only one way to live a life of blessing. That's to live it your way. By repenting of our sins, placing our faith in Christ as Savior and Lord, by guarding our minds and falling in love with you through your word as we read your word and applying its truth to our lives. Lord, we are blessed men, blessed women. And that's what we want to be. And Lord, maybe there's someone here in this place today that's never accepted Christ never repented of their sin and trusted Him as their Savior. I pray they would do that this morning. Maybe they're watching on Facebook Live. That's what they need to do today is to begin the right way of life, that right and only path, the pathway of blessing. I pray, Lord, that they, even now at this very moment, would turn from their sin and pray a prayer like this. Lord, I am a sinner. I have disobeyed you and I can never be good enough to be your child or to be worthy of heaven. But I can trust in your gift of a Savior. I believe that Jesus came to this world, lived a perfect life, died on Calvary's cross in my place so that I would not have to die. He took my sins and he wants to give me the gift of his righteousness. So, Lord, right now, the best I know how, I repent. I turn from going my own way and living, trying to live life apart from God. I want to live it your way, Lord. I trust Jesus. Lord, forgive me. Save me. Make me your child. Lord, I want to live every day for you. Thank you for hearing my prayer and for making me your child. And, Lord, it may be that someone needs to come this morning and say, I, I, I've asked you to send my life. Or they need to come and kneel on this altar and pray. Or they need to come and join here at our Mona Baptist Church. 
I pray whatever decision needs to be made will be made. Even now as we stand, Lord, make me a channel of blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. today and thank you uh, Facebook family for joining with us we pray each of you have a very uh, blessed Father's Day I want to remind you you can uh, uh, come and meet Wednesday night here at 7 for prayer meeting and then Thursday night we have our adult uh, Bible study at 7 o'clock uh, Tom Moore is leading that he has his own version of the Bible I think it's TNT Thomas's <laughs> new translation uh, that he uses uh, I've sold out rats and all the you know, you, you look like all the rats in there. Uh, but uh, you'll be blessed to uh, join with us uh, before we go I know we might want to pray uh, last week we asked you to pray for Tommy Gilliland who used to be a member here who has the virus uh, he as we understand it's come home tomorrow uh, from the hospital and so they're very grateful for your prayers Anybody else want to lift up a prayer concern? I'm not I'm going to repeat all of them. You lift it up, and then we'll pray for them. Yes. My brother Mike. Okay, Tom's brother Mike. Anyone else? All right, well, let's pray together, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your many, many blessings. We're so grateful that you're our Father. No matter what we're going through in life, we can look to you. and We know that you are the ultimate Father, omnipotent, omniscient. Uh, Lord, you can do all things, you know all things, and we know that you love us with an everlasting love. Help us go out and share that good news with this world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.